Hi, my name is Barry Stewart Mann. I'm a storyteller and this summer we're celebrating oceans of possibilities at the library. So I've brought along my map for a program that I call Riding the Waves. Real life stories from the world's oceans. People have always been thrilled by the sea. Way, hey, riding the waves, trying to fathom their deep mysteries, swimming and diving and riding the waves. Dum ba dum bum bum bum, riding the waves, learning the creatures that live down beneath. Way, hey, riding the waves, knowing their strengths and their skills and their needs, to make sure that they can keep riding the waves. Dum da dum 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 dum, riding the waves. People now know we must keep the seas clean. Way, hey, riding the waves. It's a tough challenge for you and for me to make sure our trash isn't riding the waves. Dum da dum 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 dum, riding the waves. It's true, people have always tried to learn about the seas, diving, swimming, creating things to get down underneath. People have also wanted to learn about all the creatures of the sea so that we can protect them and take care of them. And we are becoming aware that we must keep the seas clean and keep our garbage and our influence out of the seas. Well, I've brought along a group of stories that I really like from popular children's books that I think tell some wonderful things about things that have happened in the seas and the people who have helped us learn about the seas. The first one is about a man who lived about, oh, more than a hundred years ago he was born. And his name was Jacques Cousteau. He was born in this country right here called France along its Atlantic coast, which is right over here. And his story is told in a couple of wonderful books. There is Man Fish, The Story of Jacques Cousteau by Jennifer Byrne with illustrations by Eric Puibaret, and also The Fantastic Undersea Life of Jacques Cousteau, written and illustrated by Dan Yaccarino. And these two books tell us wonderful things about Jacques Cousteau, so let's get into his story. Jacques-Yves Cousteau was born in the year 1910 in a small town on the western coast of France. As a child, he was kind of sickly, <coughs> oh, and so he learned how to swim because swimming kept him very healthy. He was very curious as well. He was curious to know why rocks sink, but boats float. He drew pictures of a lot of things. He did little experiments. In fact, he made his own crane, like a big machine that could pick something up. It was even bigger than he was, and it worked. Well, he was also fascinated with cameras, which were kind of new back then. And so he saved up his money to buy one. And as soon as he got it, the first thing he did was, he didn't take a picture. He took the camera apart and then put it back together so he could figure out how it worked. Well, he also loved movies, going to see movies, learning about movies. Movies were very young. At that point, they were kind of in black and white, and you had to go to a movie theater to see them. Well, he went into the French Navy when he grew up, and while he was in the Navy, he was in a horrible car accident, and he broke both his arms. He started to swim again, or he continued swimming, but he really spent a lot of time swimming to keep himself strong and to help his arms heal. And while he was in the Navy, when he was in China, he was in a place where he saw some fishermen go diving way down in the water, holding their breath. And then they came back up and they actually caught fish with their hands. He was fascinated by that. He wanted to be able to do that. I bet you could imagine what that's like. Maybe when you've been in the pool, you've tried to hold your breath as long as you can. <gasps> we won't do it now. But... Those men held their breath for a really long time, maybe two or three minutes, and Jacques Cousteau wondered what it would be like to be able to go down in the water and stay down there for a long time. Well, a friend of his gave him a couple of goggles. They were rubber around the ends, so then when he went in the water, he could look down. Now, they did have diving equipment at that time, but it was really, really heavy. You had to put it on, and it was really hard, and there would be a tube 
that led out of the water to a place where you could get air, but that meant you couldn't go very far. He started diving with his friends Philippe and Didi, and he found down in the ocean it was a wonderful, magical world with all different kinds of colors and everything was quiet and the water flowing and the bubbles moving up. He loved it. With his friend Emile, he decided to do some experiments. He tried to make a way that he could go down in the water without having a tube attached. And they created something called the aqua lung. It was a, a long tube that had air in it, oxygen, and it connected and then they found they made a rubber suit that wasn't big and heavy, that was nice and light. They even made flippers so that they could swim fast through the ocean like fish. And so he began his career of going down underwater. But he not only went down, but I told you he also loved film. He figured out a way to put his camera into a watertight case so he could take the camera down into the water as well. And he even figured out a way to make a light that could go in the water with him. So he started going down in the water. With his friends, he bought a boat, an old Navy boat, and he named it the Calypso. And he started traveling around the world to photograph and make movies of the places he found underneath the sea. He went to places where he saw purple and green prickly plants and red branchy plants and there were spongy plants and plants that were feathery. There were plants that looked like fish and fish that looked like plants. There were also plants that if he ate them it would nourish him, make him strong, and other plants that if you ate them they could make you really sick because they were poisonous. And he kept studying all those things. His ship had two purposes, the Calypso. It was a science laboratory where he studied the things he found underneath the water. He studied the water itself. But there was also a movie studio where he took all of the film that he created and he edited it together to make movies. Well, his first movie was a movie that in his language, French, was called Le, can you say that? Le Monde du Silence. Le monde du silence. That means the world of silence or the silent world. Because the more he spent time down under the sea, the more magical that silent world was. Not only all those plants, but he saw all kinds of creatures as well. And on his ship, the Calypso, he traveled around the world. He went to the bottom part of the world, the far south by Antarctica, where he saw whales and giant squid. And off the coast of France, his own country, he found an old sunken ship that actually had casks of wine in it. And he went to Australia, where he saw kelp forests and coral reefs. And when he came back to the Mediterranean Sea, in between Europe and Africa, he started to notice that there was a lot of garbage in the sea. He also noticed that some of the kinds of animals were dying and some of the plants as well. And he realized that it was because of the effects that humans were having on the sea. That was causing the pollution and the deaths of some of the species. So he decided to dedicate his life to documenting what he saw under the sea and to teaching people about how important it is to keep the sea healthy. And here's a photo of Jacques Cousteau. You can see his aqualung on his back, his nice, simple diving suit, his flippers, maybe you can see those, and also his camera that could go underwater, and his light as well, what he used to film the marvelous things he saw deep beneath the sea. Healthy. He ended up writing, oh, 50 books, and he made dozens and dozens of movies. In fact, he had his own TV show called The Undersea World of Jacques Cousteau. And when I was little, I would watch it on TV every week. That's how I learned all about amazing creatures like hammerhead sharks and octopi and all kinds of undersea creatures. Well, that's the story of Jacques Cousteau. He helped to develop the form of scuba diving. He helped to develop the equipment that allowed people to go under the ocean. And he helped to document and teach a whole generation, actually several generations, all about the amazing undersea world, the world of silence, the silent world. 
Well, that's the story of Jacques Cousteau. We have our map behind us. We can see, I told you he came from France. This is the Mediterranean Sea right here, where he realized that humans were having an effect on the seas. Down here is Australia, where he saw those kelp forests and, and uh, coral reefs. Down below is Antarctica, where he saw the giant squid and the whales, but he traveled to all the oceans of the Earth. Let's take a minute and talk about the oceans. You might know this ocean right here is called the Indian Ocean. The one here is the Atlantic Ocean. Over here and over here, because of course they connect, are the Pacific Ocean. And there is also, up above, the Arctic Ocean. Well, that was a story about a famous male scientist. Now I have one about a famous female scientist who also helped us to understand a lot about the ocean. Her name is Marie Tharp, and her story is told in a book called Solving the Puzzle Under the Sea, written by Robert Burley with illustrations by Raoul Colomb. Marie Tharp was born not long after Jacques Cousteau, about 10 years later. She was born here in the United States. And as a girl, she grew up going along with her father, who was a cartographer. Can you say that word, cartographer? I know it sounds like photographer. Remember, Jacques Cousteau was a photographer because he took pictures. But a cartographer is someone who makes and likes and studies maps. And her father was a cartographer. He worked with farmers. He would go to different farms and help the farmers learn about the different soils they had on their farms. He'd make maps for them so they could more effectively decide where to plant all their different crops. And Marie would go along with her father and he would have her carry his supplies and he would have her help him draw the maps. So she developed a love of maps as well. She was also a very curious child and she loved learning about things, learning about science. When she was in college, one of her professors happened to say, you know, it's interesting. When we look at a map of the world, we have all kinds of information about the land. We know where the mountains are and the deserts and the lakes and so on. But the seas, we just color blue. We don't know much about what's underneath the seas and what the bottom of the sea is like. Marie kept that in her mind. When she graduated from college, she wanted to get a job working as a scientist in a company or an organization that studied the seas. But she found when she went to one, well, the woman that she talked to, and she said, I'd like to come and work here and be a scientist, the woman said, oh, we don't need a secretary. We don't need any more file clerks. You see, back then, oh, about 100 years ago, uh, sometimes women weren't given the same opportunities as men. Sometimes people thought that women couldn't do the same things that men could do. And that was hard for Marie Tharp. But she kept trying, and she did get a job as a scientist. In the place where she worked, her boss was a man named Doc Ewing. And she was given responsibilities studying all kinds of information and helping to figure out things about the seas. But at that time, there were research ships that went out. And one day, she said to her boss, Doc Ewing, she said, I'd like to go out onto one of the research ships. He said, well, Marie, you know, it's considered bad luck for a woman to go on a ship. Can you imagine that? A scientist talking about good or bad luck? Is that what science is about? Science is about studying the evidence, looking at the facts. So Marie made sure that he understood that wasn't good science, and she was given a chance to go out onto boats. At that time, scientific researchers were starting to understand about how deep the ocean was in different places. They had discovered a method to figure it out. Before that, they used to try and drop a string or a rope or a cord down and, and until it hit the bottom and measure it, but that's kind of hard to do in places where the ocean might be a mile or two miles deep. But they found what they could do or what, call, what are called soundings. That's using sound. You might know that sound travels in waves. And what they would do is they would take a ship, we'll just use this little ship, and from the ship they would send a sound down. I don't know what it sounded like, but it might have been something like beep, 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 beep. And when it got to the bottom of the sea, it would bounce back. Beep, 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 beep. You know what that's called, an echo. And of course, if the sea wasn't so deep, it, the echo would come back more quickly. Beep, 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 beep. 
or if it was deeper, there were many, many research ships around the world that were taking soundings. That is, they were measuring how deep the ocean was at specific places. And Marie realized that if she gathered all of this information, all of this data, all of these numbers about different points in the ocean, she might be able to map the ocean floor. And that's just what she did. Uh, on her dining room table, she put out a big map that looked kind of like this, and, and she drew the outline of North America and South America, and the outline of Europe and Africa. In between them is the Atlantic Ocean. And then she started gathering all the information that closer to the land, it was not as deep, maybe 300 feet, 500 feet, 1,000 feet, 2,000 feet, and in deeper, it might be 8,000 feet, 9,000 feet. And she started getting a picture of what the ocean's floor looked like. She had a partner named Bruce Heason, and together they plotted all of those points, and then they got an artist to paint it as a map. Now, as they were researching this, they realized that through the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, there was kind of a mountain range under the water, a mid-Atlantic ridge. But then she also noticed that within that ridge, there was a rift, like a little cut in the middle of it. And she got the idea that perhaps that indicated that the parts of the surface under the water might be moving ever so slightly. Up until then, people thought that even though the Earth moves around the sun, that the pieces on the surface of the Earth didn't move at all. But through her research, she convinced her partner Bruce Heason and then the rest of the scientific community that actually there are plates, they're kind of pieces of land that move ever so slightly. And she helped to develop the field called plate tectonics, understanding that even the surface of the earth, both on the surface and underneath, has movement. But don't worry, as uh, they say in the book, it's only moving about one inch per year. Not a whole lot, so we won't fall down. But Marie Tharp and Bruce Heason ended up developing a wonderful map of the ocean's floor. And here is an example of what that map looked like. They used different colors to show the different levels, the different depths, and it became a work of art. In fact, the Heason Tharp map uh, was taken by museums, schools, and people even got copies of it to hang in their living rooms. And that's the story of how Marie Tharp solved the puzzle under the sea. Our next story is about something amazing that happened 30 years ago. There was an accident that was not particularly good for the ocean, but it actually ended up unexpectedly providing a lot of very useful information for scientists. You see, about 30 years ago, there was a ship that was leaving China and sailing across the Pacific Ocean to arrive with cargo in Tacoma, Washington in the United States. But, as you'll hear, there was an accident. And the amazing story inspired a couple of delightful picture books that are especially good for our younger readers. One of them is called Ten Little Rubber Ducks by Eric Carle. You might have heard of Eric Carle because he has a lot of very popular children's books, including uh, The Very Busy Spider, The Very Grouchy Ladybug, The Very Hungry Caterpillar, and Head to Toe, The Tiny Seed, many others. And another book is called Ducky, written by Eve Bunting, with illustrations by David Wisniewski. Now, both of these are fanciful recreations of parts of that story. The authors kind of took their inspiration from it and then made stories of their own, thinking about the adventures of some lucky little rubber duckies. In China, long ago, but not that long ago, about 30 years ago, there was a factory that made rubber ducks. <laughs> the rubber ducks were shaped, made out of rubber, and then they were made so that they would make that little squeaking sound, and the beaks were painted red, and the eyes were painted blue, and then they were put into cartons, packed 
tightly together, and the cartons were taken out to the dock and put on a ship. There were 29,000 little rubber ducks on that ship. Well, the ship set off from China, sailing across the Pacific Ocean. But in the northern Pacific Ocean, where the weather can get very rough, the wind can get very strong, and the waves can be very big, there was a gigantic storm. And the waves surged, and the wind blew. And in the midst of that storm, one of the boxes, one of the cartons, fell off the boat into the sea. And the rubber ducks got out. Now in his book, Eric Carl imagines what might have happened to 10 of those little rubber ducks. He says that once it got calm, the rubber ducks were floating this way and that. He said one of them floated to the west and met a dolphin <coughs> that jumped over it. Another floated to the east and met a seal. <coughs> one of them floated to the north and met a polar bear that growled. Another one floated to the south and met a flamingo that just stared at it. One floated up and looked down and saw an octopus. One floated down and looked up and saw a seagull flying up above. One floated to the right and saw a turtle gliding by. And one floated to the left and saw a pelican chattering. <laughs> one floated this way and saw a big whale flapping its tail. And they say the last one, the tenth one, met a whole family of ducks. Quack, 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 quack. And so, that little duck followed along behind them. Well, the duck wasn't really following. It was just floating behind them. And according to Eric Carle, the duck floated, and day turned to night, and then day again, and the duck was in the wide blue sky. Well, in the other book by Eve Bunting, she tells of how a rubber duck that she calls Ducky endured the waves, endured the storms, uh, saw other little rubber ducks this way and that, and, and she imagines that this little duck really missed them. Until finally, the little rubber duck, Ducky, landed on a beach. And along came a boy who found it and took the duck to school. Because in the town where he lived in Alaska, people were finding lots of little rubber ducks along the beach. And the teacher was keeping records of what had been found, who had found it, where it had been found, when it had been found. And you know what? That teacher was one of just many people around the world who did that. You see, when that happened in real life, ducks and other little rubber animals that were in those boxes, they floated all over the world. You can see this is a map that was generated that shows that some of them did float to the south and came to places like Indonesia, Australia, and even the coast of South America. Others floated north and went into the Arctic Ocean and then across the top of North America and down into the Atlantic Ocean. This map was created about 18 years after uh, the, the actual accident happened, and that was 12 years ago. So I'm sure the ducks are still floating, and many of them are still out there. And that is the story of that amazing adventure that little rubber ducks had traveling all over the world because of the accident from that ship. The story that is told in those books, Ten Little Rubber Ducks and Ducky. And our last story is not about ten little rubber ducks, but it's about eight real live dolphins. And it also involves a big storm. It takes place in this area right here. It's a body of water called the Gulf of Mexico, which sticks out from the Atlantic Ocean. It's not too far from where we are in the southern United States. And it's a story told in the book called The Eight Dolphins of Katrina, a true tale of survival written by Janet Wyman Coleman with illustrations by Jan Nassimbene. And it's a real story of adventure and survival. 
dolphins. If you've ever been lucky enough to see dolphins in real life, or even if you haven't, you probably know that dolphins are amazing creatures. They're beautiful to watch, they're very playful, they are also very intelligent. They were a main attraction for tourists coming to the Marine Life Oceanarium in Gulfport, Mississippi, where they were also trained and they were studied as well. Well, in the year 2005, in late summer, things weren't looking good there on the coast of Mississippi because there was a big storm brewing out over the sea. The kind of storm you've probably heard of, a hurricane. You know a hurricane is a mixture of air and wind and swirling water and high pressure and low pressure, all those things that meteorologists, weather scientists talk about. And it could cover hundreds and hundreds of miles and it was swirling around. And this one, Hurricane Katrina, was heading right to the coast. Well, the scientists at the Marine Life Oceanarium, they were worried about the dolphins because their facility was very close to the beach and they knew there could be a giant wave that could come and wash over it. They knew that the winds would be horribly strong. They also knew that their enclosures and their tanks for the, the dolphins were not necessarily strong enough to withstand all that force and all that water. So, these scientists, there were several of them, Tim, Dr. Moby, Shannon, Marcy, they were calling around to figure out if there was anywhere that the dolphins could be moved where they'd be safe. They found one hotel uh, that was willing to take some dolphins to keep them in, the, in their swimming pool, but they realized that the pool was only big enough to take three of the dolphins, and another hotel also, but their pool would only take three. So that left eight dolphins. And the, the scientists realized they would just have to leave there in the dolphin tank and hope for the best. Well, those eight dolphins, I've brought along some of my puppets and toys to be those dolphins. Right? There's this one. We'll call this one Kelly, because the dolphins did have names, and, and Shelly. And, oh, this one. This is a, a little finger puppet. Tony. And we've got, oh, Jackie. Jackie was the oldest of the dolphins. And, mm, Noah. And, oh, this one's a puppet. Elijah, <laughs> and another puppet, Tamra, and I think that might be, oh, one more. We'll use this one from our other story. This was Jill. Those were the eight that the scientists would have to leave behind because the scientists had to pack up their stuff and go to be home with their families, maybe even to pack up their families and drive further inland because as the hurricane passed over the land, it would get weaker and not cause as much damage. So the date came, August 28th, 2005. Everyone packed up, everyone left, and the eight dolphins were left at the oceanarium. August 29th, Hurricane Katrina hit with amazing force. The hurricane was unforgiving. It was relentless. It battered the seaside. It destroyed houses. It destroyed whole towns and it destroyed the marine life ocean area. In the following days, when the storm had moved further north and gotten weak over the land and everything on the coast calmed down, the scientists, Tim, Dr. Moby, Shannon, Marcy, they made their way back and they found the marine life ocean area in absolute tatters. It was destroyed and the dolphin tank was empty. They realized that those eight dolphins of Katrina must have been taken out to sea because they were nowhere to be found. Well, you might think, oh, that's cool. The dolphins could go out to sea. Dolphins live in the sea. But remember, these were dolphins that had been raised in the Marine Life Aquarium. They were used to having food given to them. They were trained. They were accustomed to being around people, but they were not accustomed to being around other creatures, especially predators. Uh, the scientists worried uh, that these dolphins couldn't survive out in the wild and were sure that they would die, and who knows where they might have ended up. So in the days following the hurricane, the scientists called around to see if they could get any help. They needed to find boats. They needed to find helicopters that could go out and search. But of course, all along the coast, there was disaster everywhere. Helicopters and boats were being used to help all kinds of people. 
But as time went by, some people responded, oh, you're only caring about dolphins, they can live out in the sea. But the scientists explained, no, they can't. And some people said, oh, it's only eight of them, but they said, these are very important. Uh, they're very important for us to study, and they're dolphins that we really care about. And eventually, they were able to borrow boats and helicopters, and they went off into the sea. Days passed. Uh, they made dolphin sounds. They clanged on things. They tried to do anything that might call the dolphins back to them. They didn't know if they were in the right part of the Gulf of Mexico at all. Maybe the dolphins had swum miles and miles away. But they held on to hope five days, six days, nine days, ten days. And on the twelfth day, they heard something. It was Tamra. See, I have a puppet that does that. Tamra popped out of the water, and they, they were amazed, and they saw that Tamra had survived. And then out came Elijah. And soon... They were followed by others. Noah came, and, and Shelley came. Noah and Shelley, and Kelly came. And also, uh, there was Jill, and there was Tony. But one did not come. They wondered. It was the oldest. It was Jackie. They knew that Jackie uh, was old. Jackie was weak. Jackie might not have survived. But then, at last, Jackie came. <laughs> And all eight of the dolphins somehow survived for days in the wild ocean on their own. Here's a photograph of what the dolphins looked like. This is a real photograph of the eight dolphins of Katrina when they came back to the, to the ship. And, of course, I, it was lucky that they found them, but it wasn't always easy from there because they had to figure out how to get the dolphins out of the sea. They had to make sure that they were healthy. Uh, they threw uh, little balls of food to them with their vitamins. They taught the dolphins to put their tails up against the, the vessels that they had so that they could do blood tests from the dolphins, get blood and check it on their health. And eventually they got the dolphins to throw themselves onto the surface of a low-lying boat, and then they got them back in. And that is the tale of survival of the eight dolphins of Katrina. Well, friends, there you have it. We have traveled to all of the Earth's oceans through stories. We shared stories about amazing scientists, Jacques Cousteau, Marie Tharp, and amazing events as well. <laughs> the crate of little rubber duckies that ended up sending them all over the world and helping scientists understand about the currents and the, the movements of the seas, and also the amazing rescue of those eight dolphins of Katrina. People have always been thrilled by the seas, way, hey, riding the waves. The oceans are full of amazing stories, true life tales of riding the waves. I hope you continue to explore wonderful stories about the oceans, about the oceans of possibilities that we're celebrating this summer. My name is Barry Stewart Mann. Thank you very much.